Welcome to libcurl under the hood. Uh, this is going to be a presentation about stuff internally in libcurl, how, how we deal with transfers, connections, a little bit of protocol handlers, internal APIs and uh, stuff like that in an attempt to describe how libcurl works in case you're interested in working with libcurl, doing pull requests, changing libcurl or just, you know, you're just curious how this stuff is made out uh, uh, or created. So I'm going to try to get all this stuffed into this presentation. This is the first time I do it. I worked on it for a while, but I will, we'll see how it works out. Um, so first I'm going to just get you uh, sort of get, uh, get you back on track on how the API works, some just basics, and then a little bit about how transfers works internally for easy interface, the multi interface. And then I will take you into the transfer state machine, which is going to be wild. Uh, and it's the first time I've documented it and uh, <laughs> it's, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And then a little bit about how the functionality works for, the, for some of the multifunctions that are important for, for the functionality really. And then protocol handlers, the something about different caches and pools we have, how we deal with the different backends to provide functionality, you know, conditionally depending on, on build time stuff. And then a few words about portability and how we accomplish that in curl or sort of how we approach it. And I want to emphasize that uh, uh, you can see the date here in the video. It says April 30, 2021, and that's we're going to release 7.77.0 uh, in, well, four weeks. So <clears throat> with that, I, I want to say that I'm going to talk about internals in libcurl and, and things that are not exposed in the API or being sort of in the ABI, they might change. So if you look at this video far away into the future, things may have changed. They may not work like this anymore. But this said, a lot of this, what I'm going to describe are generic things that have been working like this for a long time. So they're not likely to change massively um, going forward either, but you know, they might. So I'm going to start out just describing a little bit about the public API. When we design or think about how we do things in, in curl for in the API, we add support for something and we have the ambition to support whatever we add forever. So there's never any end date to anything we add to curl. Whatever we uh, adopt, we support, we, um, well, whatever we get into curl, we support it. We, there, there's never going, we're never going to pick it out again. So <clears throat> that's very important when we design API. So they, we need to take that into account. The API is very transfer oriented because libcurl is a transfer library. We talk about transfers and that's the primary um, object or whatever. The, the, the primary handles you work with in curl are around transfers, not connections or not protocols, but transfers. So if you just think about transfers as the primary thing we do with curl, that's that's an easy thing to get in your mind. We use opaque handles, which means that that's uh, just a phrase, right? But it means that you don't actually get any data out just the hand. It's, it's C code, but you get a handle, but the handle doesn't actually say anything. It's all internal to curl. You're like from I, I got the inspiration pretty much from you do how the, you, you do, do the file handles in, in C, you know, uppercase file. You don't actually know what it contains or what it's used for. It's just a handle and you use that as input to other functions to get information or do stuff. We, <clears throat> so you get, you have one of those handles and you create something and then we have set opts to change options and defaults in curl. And that's the general uh, sort of standard we have for, for the different, we have a few different, we call them different APIs in curl and they all have different set up functions to change options. So you get a default, uh, default behavior and default set of options. By default, if you don't do anything, so you get a sensible thing, a secure setup, and then you change them with setup. There are a lot of setups. And the, the idea here is that the API should be easy to use for simple stuff. So we should have a sound 
good basic set of defaults so it should you don't typical typically you could be happy with the default but you can always change it to something if you have specific needs and we've tried to not require what i call deep protocol knowledge when uh, using the api it will of course help you to and uh, to know the protocols you're working with when you use the libcurl api as well but you usually don't need to know very i mean very much so <laughs> and uh that, that, uh, that's why we're also trying to keep them oriented to, uh, around transfers. So you just think of URLs as uh, uh, pointing to data and you use curl to transfer data either from or to that URL. And it, you, I think it's, it works pretty well like that. So when you, do, uh, when you do a transfer with curl using the easy interface, uh, it's called easy because it's simpler than the others and it's synchron synchronous so it's fairly easy to, to use and implement so you create an easy handle um, and you set options in that easy handle this is one transfer so you create so to set up a transfer you set options url what you want to do uh, timeouts some other specific things you want and then you ask curl to perform the transfer it will do the entire transfer synchronously until it's done and done could then of course also mean a failure <clears throat> and after you're done you clean up after the transfer you that means you basically uh, erase the handle again and you're done that's that's the four really really basic steps for doing a transfer using libcurl using the int use interface and here's uh, one what I just said shown in code right so just the simple steps you create the easy handle uh, curl easy init returns a, a, a handle or no if it fails you set options uh, in this case you set uh, the url because you want a url url is the only option that is mandatory you really need to set a url because otherwise you don't need to know what to transfer right and in this case you also ask curl to follow location headers that's redirects in http um, <clears throat> and then ask curl to perform that transfer and in this case, we didn't tell curl where to send the output, which then of course makes it um, uh, just send it to standard out, which may, may or may not be what you want, but that's at least what it does. So if that's not what you want, you'd do something else or, or do more options that would, <coughs> I mean, be more of what you want to do. And in the, uh, curl is a perform returns an error code that you can check after the transfer is done so did it succeed or fail uh, and if it failed in this case it will show an error code <coughs> error message actually and uh, then after it's done you clean up the handle again so that every resource and everything that curl used is freed and returned to the system easy peasy but you, when you do the same with the multi interface you create one or more easy handles for transfers because when you use the multi interface you can do many parallel transfers and then you set options for those transfers exactly the same way as you did with easy easy the easy interface and then you create the multi handle which is basically says here's a handle that can take many transfers instead of one so and then you can also set some specific options for that multi handle and then bam run um well, you have to add all the handles to the belt handle too. But then you drown, then you sort of, yes, run all the handles, um, all the transfers <coughs> until they're done. Well, you don't have to drive them until they're all done, but that's sort of <laughs> the, general, the basic thing is you often want to do that. And, uh, and then you do wait for something to happen and then you ask for it to, to run more. And I'll, I'll show you how it looks like. So here's a very simple, uh, multi-interface using code in this case we're only doing a single transfer but uh, if you start out here we, we create an easy handle and this could create more than one you can cr actually you can add any number of uh, easy handles here <coughs> um, 
And uh, what, what I could add perhaps is that of course this works independently of what protocol you're doing. So uh, while I'm showing HTTP and HTTPS in, in these examples, you could, you, this works exactly the same whatever URL you're adding as long as curl supports the transport uh, protocol that you're specifying and curl supports 25, 25 different ones. So you just make sure that you specify one that your curl is built to support. So here you created an easy handle, you set options for that, and you could do that for many uh, easy handles at the same time here. And then you create a multi handle, which is pretty much a stack. You, so you could add many easy handles to. So in this case, you create the multi handle and look at this, you add the easy handle to the multi handle. That's, that's the concept here. So the multi handle holds a number of easy handles, any number could be 1000s. <coughs> And then you, you create a little loop here. While this loop is still running, perform the transfer. And in this case, you will <coughs> the multi current multi-perform here takes, as you see, the first argument is a multi-pointer. That's the handle for the multi-handle. Uh, and it'll also get uh, the number of easy handles still running in that second argument, which allows you to do something like this. <coughs> If the transfer is still running, if any transfer is still running, this could be hundreds of transfers, and if any of them are still running, you wait for activity. You wait for either transfer, I mean, to data to arrive, to the uh, the socket to be ready to send data, or there's a timeout. So this will just wait for something of, the, of that to happen, and then it'll loop the loop and do again. So basically, it'll just iterate around this loop until all the transfers are done that you set up like this way. In this example, of course, just one transfer. <clears throat> and then when you're done, you would remove the easy handle again from the multi handle. Well, all the easy handles, if you have many, you would clean up the easy handle and you would clean up the multi handle and voila, you're done. So that's, that's, this is the, I mean, the outside, the API outside. And then just to complicate matters a little bit more, there's also the multi socket interface which is the uh, event-based thing that you do if you want to do an event-based uh, well main loop really in your application instead of having it depend on select or poll you use the multi-socket thing and it's uh, event system agnostic which means that you can use either you can use epoll lib event lib ev lib uv whatever uh, event system you like or want or prefer, you can go with that because libcurl doesn't care. It's built to be independent of that. <clears throat> so yeah, all of that, all these multi, all these multi interface will of course make sure that <clears throat> everything this works in the same thread, non-blocking. <clears throat> so it'll just do a little bit of piece for each transfer as long as it can and then iterate over the next transfer. So you. All of these are all the multi interface stuff is doing all the number of transfers in the same thread. And uh, uh, of course, if you do the correct protocols like HP2, you can also do them multiplexed over the same connections and stuff like that. So, anyway, when you're doing the multi socket interface, um, libcurl tells the application what sockets and what timeouts to wait for. So, basically, as feeding, so you your application can then tell that to your event library, whatever you use, epoll or lib event or stuff like that. And then when something happens, you call this function. You're, you get a signal from your event library and you call the curl multi socket action. There was some action, either activity on a socket or a timeout. Uh, I won't show you an, an example of the multi socket, partly because event-based programming is more complicated and it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated for me to just show you on this stream. But uh, I've tried to document it in the Everything Curl book and there are tutorials on how to do it, so you should read it up. There are some examples too in the examples directory. So <clears throat> that that's the public API, right? But in the, there are some primary structs here I, I wanted to just get, get into. So when I say curl handles, that's what they're also we are, sometimes we call them easy handles because for the they're for the easy interface. So they're they're what we show to the outside, right? So in in the API. So they are, you use them like this: curl asterisk a. In this case, we call the variable a, and they're opaque on the outside. So you can't 
see them, what they contain in your application, but on the inside in libcurl they're called struct curl easy. Uh, I think the naming <laughs> in this case is pretty good. So you can see that, yeah, uh, we we use curl with uppercase C when that's a private global symbol within the library. So when you create one of these handles, you get one of these structs. Easy. And each of the curl easy handles, it, you see it, it grew a little bit here because it can grow because when it's used, it'll, it might and will allocate buffers and stuff like that. And also when you're using this, in this case, you're using this transfer with this handle and then it will create a connection and use that connection. And the connections are a separate object. Well, they are handled as separate objects in libcurl called struct connect data. But it's a traditional name with historical reasons why it's called like this and we haven't changed it. So it's, it's called struct connect data. Um, so the, the easy handle has a, uh, an active connection. So that's when you're, if you're doing it HTTP transfer, for example, you have one connection because that's the transfer is going to use the connection. <clears throat> but you might also, uh, as I showed you before, do the follow uh, location uh, option. And that means that, for example, you will ask curl to follow redirects, which might lead to using another connection perhaps for the second request or the third request and the fourth request and that and and curl will not close previous connections uh, if unless it has to so it'll keep previously used connections that are still alive in the connection pool like this here's a connection pool and it shows that well we keep older used connections in the pool in case we need that connection again. So if you set up a new transfer, curl will first check uh, if there's an existing connection from the pool to use for the next transfer. This is of course for connection reuse and it's really, um, if you're doing, if you're writing an application where you're getting stuff from the same server over and over again, this is really what makes it fast and snappy because if you have an, a, a live connection already set up to the server, that's really fast and handy for the application. And of course it works like this. So it, it extracts one connection from the pool and that's the active one that it uses when, when you're doing a single transfer. <clears throat> More specifically, it actually works like this, that every easy handle is associated even internally with a multi-handle because internally everything is a multi-interface. So as I showed you before, there's the easy interface and there's the multi-interface. So multi-interface can handle any amount of transfers, but internally everything is a multi-transfer. The, the easy interface is just implemented as a wrapper around the multi-interface which means that every in is easy interface is associated with the multi-handle and the multi-handle owns the connection cache or the connection pool. This, uh, this has some importance because it actually works like this then. So if you set up two transfers using the multi-interface like this, the A and the B transfer, they are associated to the same multi-handle. And <clears throat> they, of course, then you, if you do two transfers to two different hosts, they will get one connection each. So th then it looks pretty much like this. But you can also then use them. Uh, you could do two transfers to the same host. And if you would use a multiplexed uh, protocol like HTTP2, they could use like this. They could set up a single connection. You could do two transfers that would actually use the same connection, just multiplexed uh, like this. And of course, there's still the pool. So they have uh, older connections still around and you can of course complicate matters even more if you add a third transfer that perhaps uses the second host and the two first transfers use the first host. So of course it adds up and all of this is handled by the multi-handle, the curl multi-structure. That's the multi-handle that sort of keeps everything of this together. <clears throat> So we're starting to get a little feel here for what we're looking at. The multi-handle holds a lot of one or more easy handles. So the easy handles are each taking care of a single transfer. The connect data struct are 
each holding a single connection. <clears throat> and we're executing. When we're doing transfers with this, we have the curl multi-perform that I mentioned, uh, how to do the multi, uh, using the multi-API. And since the uh, easy, uh, easy API is just a wrapper around the multi-API, actually all transfers are done like this, uh, more or less. So when, when you do a multi-perform, it'll go through the number of easy handles added to that handle, which could be one handle or it could be many handles. So it'll just iterate over all those. In this slide here, you can see four transfers added to the multi-handles. If you just perform, it'll just iterate over each of them and do as much as it can for each transfer and then go back and, and allow the application to wait for something to happen and then do this over and over again. And that's the way it drives uh, one to very many transfers. And each transfer, each curl easy handle has a state variable. And, and this, it actually has a lot of state variables, of course, but the, here's the main state variable called M state. It, it stands for multi state for, for the multi interface. Um, so, well, I could I could clarify that when you're using the easy interface, the, the it'll get a multi uh, in it get a multi handle created internally and sort of hidden from the AP, in the API. So it'll use the multi interface internally and just provide the easy interface for users to just as a convenience. But uh, so the, when you're using the multi interface, it's more like how curl actually works internally. But anyway, well, so w when when we drive a single transfer, well, all transfers are driven like the multi interface, right? So a multi handle and a number of transfers. And each transfer is a curl easy struct. And each curl easy struct has this state variable. That's the, this is the main transfer state for this particular transfer. And this, again, this works for all protocols. So the all, for all protocols, for all transfers, it drives a state machine. And this, and, and this state variable can iterate over these states that I have here mentioned uh, on, <laughs> on the slide. I think there are 13, 15 different states. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll get back to the states, but basically it works like this. So if you do the curl easy perform, when you do an easy interface transfer, you have the easy handle that's the one you're seeing in your application and it has its internal uh, struct multi which is the multi handle internally <coughs> so anyway for then for each state uh, it has in this curl easy handle it it it'll do work and then stay in the state if it's if if it has to or change state to another state and then until it would block and then it will return so it will never block and in any execution in the multi interface so it will just you know stay in the state if it has to or work on stuff and change state and until it would block and then return so it'll it will never block that's of course the key because it needs to handle any amount of concurrent transfers that so blocking on any transfer would be really bad for all the other transfers so it needs to handle everything in a non blocking fashion and here again all the states did I have the wrong names on the states on the previous slide? Maybe I did. Because when I was working on this presentation, I started working on this presentation actually a, a while ago. And, and then I realized that the state names were really crappy. For, for So you didn't really understand them basically by reading them. I'm not sure you can understand them now either, but I at least cleaned them up so that it's possible to understand them. And I'm I'm more able to actually describe them and document them. And really, in general, the states are your um, a transfer is moving over the states in a top to bottom order. Here, you start with the init. You might go into the pending. You go to the connect, and you might then sit in the resolving state while resolving host name. You might sit in the connecting state, which is doing the connect uh, request to a HTTP proxy. Uh, you might sit in the tunneling, which is now that's the uh, connect i can't even remember myself and a, a few different things setting up things in the co different connect 
uh, transfer states, and then a few different do states, which is sending the actual protocol request to set up the transfer. And then there's um, the performing state, which is the actual, usually transferring the main body of a transfer. <coughs> um, and then uh, and then there's a few other th things that you could go into the rate limiting state and when you're done you go to the done state and so on uh, this is the main complicated tr transfer state machine graph and i'll i'll explain it a, a little bit i think um this is a, this is more of a picture that you could possibly use as a, to look at to understand something, and and uh, I actually made an effort to make sure that all these arrows are actually true state uh, possible trans state transitions in the state machine. So uh, <clears throat> let me uh, let me just uh, try to explain this for a little while at least. So we start out in the init state. Every transfer starts out in the init state, and if you look at the top, we go from init and when we're done, we go to the message sent. So pretty much if from init to message sent, then you're done. But how do you get to the message sent uh, state? That's the, that's the key, right? So you start out. And another little thing here is um, uh, everything that has this striped background, you know, the little stripes here, they have a connection associated to the transfer. So when there's no lines behind the state, there's no connection anymore. <clears throat> okay, anyway, anyway, back to the init state. We start, that's the start button. I'm such a, you know. Um, so you start from the init and you go down to the connect state. That's where you want to connect. You want to set up a connection or get a connection um, to use. And if you don't get a connection, maybe because you have set up some limits, you know, number of connections per host or other limits to your your ability to get a connection you might go to the pending state and sit in the pending state for a while and then you can go back to the connect state when you want to retry and maybe get a connection this time or you could get back to, that's you can get stuck in the pending for a while um, but otherwise you can you will go through the various blue states to try to get a connection set up resolving connecting tunneling through a, a proxy the protoconnect is setting up things in a protocol specific way like ftp or stuff like that when you have a little bit of a command response setup thing just to get the connection um, ready for the particular file transfer um, and while one when so when you're done through the blue phase which is setting up things you go to the green phase and the green phase is the do phase that's when you're actually asking for uh, a resource which in the simple case http that's usually maybe a get request get me that document and that's just that's easy but then you'd say the client sends get blah 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 and then you move to the performing phase which uh, then um, performs the main transfer and you might then go into the rate limiting uh, state if you're doing things faster than you set up it to allow to because you i mean the user sets the rate limiting right so if you want to allow curl to use uh, to not be faster than a specific limit it could go into the rate limiting and back to the performing again back and forth there to keep the rate limit and when when it's done with its transfer phase of the main transfer phase it'll go to the done state um, which then, then when the perform when we've done the main data transfer and after done it'll you can see the stripes vanish there because then it goes to the completed and then it's dropped the connection or left the connection and it's completed and it sends the message to internally that it's completed and it goes to the message sent state and voila the transfer is complete and I mean, this is a very, this is a high level transfer state machine. And this is all, and as you can see, uh, you can, there's a lot of shortcuts in this state machine. You, you don't need very few transfers actually, you know, go through all of, all of the states. I guess that's pretty much impossible. You don't go through all states. It also varies a little bit, but different protocols can go through different states in different ways. But, but still, I, I'm showing you this graph pretty much because this is 
you can see the state machine in the multi.c source file and this is a core thing to curl and all transfers do this and um what and you, you then ask him okay how how is this translated into protocols and, and stuff like that but almost all protocols have ways to extend or hook into these different states and i'll show you how it works uh, what with what we call protocol handlers uh, in curl <clears throat> first i will just I'll, I'll get to that in, in a second first i will just say that we, we also have this when when we do when you ask for a multi-interface transfer in curl, there's also this uh, uh, um, function called curl multi FD set, as you can see here the, in, in the title. Uh, <clears throat> it'll return what file descriptors your application should wait for. Uh, and that could then be for, you know, uh, any number of concurrent transfers that curl is now uh, working with right now. So it actually then, um, asks the it goes iterates through the multi interface for all easy interfaces it checks the the in which transfer state it is how the the connection is uh, doing and then it talks to the handler struct and get the particular information about the sockets it's fairly complicated but it returns a very easy uh, data on the outside for the outside for the API and for the application because then you know oh I just have to wait for this uh, these activities for these sockets and when something happens I know that it ha something happened on any of the w one or many of the of the transfers that curl is uh, dealing with right now so it, so of course then it again it the multi interface it, the multi handle uh, deals with a lot of curl easy handles and it'll just iterate over them and at, at the same time it also the, the multi interface also can return the curl multi timeout which is the shortest amount of time uh, you should wait until you call curl again because we have a lot of timeouts of course internally so you don't you shouldn't just you know wait forever until you call curl again because in the multi interface the control is in the application right so curl doesn't execute normally the the application is waiting for activity and the application is deciding when to call curl again so to to deal with this every curl every transfer every easy handling curl has a list of timeouts that it wants to to deal with basically a set of timeouts a number of them and they're sorted so the this the ones that is is about to execute next is the first in line and it'll have i don't know how many i think it could be like 15 or so per transfer <clears throat> i, I it usually it rarely use all of them but uh, anyway it works like that and <clears throat> and since a, a multi interface then can have any number of transfers and all those transfers have timeouts <clears throat> each transfer then knows its shortest shortest amount of time until so that that it wants a timeout and then we have a sorted splay tree that sorts the shortest time <clears throat> so that the curl multi handle always knows the shortest time for any of the involved transfers uh, <clears throat> that's a fairly complicated way to explain it but um still it's it's a sorted tree so we know one we have one timeout value which is the shortest time that any of the transfers uh, when any of the transfers want to be called again so we have this sorted splay tree that's why we have a splay tree algorithm in the, in the code and it works pretty good and it makes it really fast to find which if you have a thousand con concurrent transfers and we have a timeout which of the transfers wants to get handled you don't want to iterate over a thousand transfers all the time you need to get them in the right order so you need to <clears throat> figure out which ones have timed out and only deal with those that timed out and the display tree makes that really good and efficient <clears throat> okay and we of course have a lot of caches and pools i talked about the, the connection pool that holds on to living connections or uh, connections that haven't been closed so that we can reuse a connection again in a subsequent request but we have a lot of other things that we keep around we have con 
connections I mentioned. We have uh, SSL session IDs and, and uh, session tickets. Uh, we have uh, DNS, we have cookies, uh, all service hosts, uh, and we have HTTPS. All of those are different caches. They're all kept in memory. Some of them can be stored on disk <coughs> and read back from disk as well. So basically they're all um, based uh, around the multi-handle and which means that the multi-handle owns the, the different caches, which is a convenient thing because when you add multiple handles to the same multi-handle, they can share the caches. So it's if you add many transfers to the same multi-handle, they share the same DNS cache and the cookie cache and, and all of those. Um, well, you can also make it not to, but but it'll do that by default anyway. So if you do many, <clears throat> it's very convenient, for example, that it shares the connection cache because connections, reusing connections is, is key to performance, as I mentioned before. And there's also a, a share interface concept. So you can actually set up a share handle and, and tell that to instead own the caches and you can point individual transfers to that share object instead of using the multi interface and the multi handles caches which of course adds complexity but it also adds freedom because now you can decide exactly which transfers that should reuse which for example dns cache or cookie jar and stuff like that and I, um, back to how we do transfers, I mentioned the transfer state machine, which was really complicated. And the state machine is generic for all protocols. And we can do that by making sure that each implemented protocol in curl has a handler. It's each protocol is set up or described internally with a curl handler as a curl handler struct, really. So when you want to implement support for your favorite protocol, which we could discuss, of course, but uh, imagine you have a, a, a new protocol you want to support for it. You want then you want to create a new source file. You want to set up this struct handler struct and fill in all the entries here so that your protocol, particular protocol, works. <coughs> um, so yeah, you de declare. You know what's the name of the URL scheme? How do you? Do you need any specifics to set up the connection, specifics to send the actual, uh, the do thing, which do is then asking for a resource or, uh, and done is what you do after you've done the entire transfer the, uh, and stuff like that. Um, if number of different things that uh, are protocol specific, <clears throat> which then drives the generic protocol handler in curl because the generic parts then don't need to know about protocol specifics. Um, th this makes it, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to use the word easy to implement a protocol, but for the majority of, of all code in curl, you don't need to think about particular protocol specifics, but because protocol specifics can be put into their own files because they're handled by their own structs and pretty much by their own protocol handlers. So if you, for example, I, I get a lot of questions about f uh, rarely used protocols like Gopher or I don't know RTMP or stuff. But usually you don't have to care about that because you don't you won't see that much in the code. They're taken care of in their own protocol handlers and their own source code. So for most people, you never see that unless you're specific, particularly interested in that protocol. But for the generic transfer parts, they're generic. They don't they don't even. Um, expose that so basically it works like this done so there's the uh, from from the left here that the application goes it goes through the public api into the transfer engine here and or in the transfer engine which is the generic transfer how you do protocol stuff they each have their own connect data of course connect being the the connection and each connection then knows about uh, the particular protocol use so they identify the protocol with a curl handlers pointer really and that's how they drive the particular protocol uh, and i could add that uh, uh, tls versions of the protocols have their own curl handlers so you can actually sp so when you s use the for example, HTTP has one handler and HTTPS has another handler. So the difference, you could set up different function pointers. Usually they uh, then have a number of functions 
together and a few that separates them. <coughs> um, that's how, how we use different protocols. And then we of course have the concept of different backends, which means that we can implement different protocols or different part of protocols using different backends. And uh, a backend here is what I call uh, a selectable alternative implementation, which means that when you build curl, you could uh, add, you know, you could provide feature X using one of these three different uh, alternatives, A, B, and C. And you pick that, you make that decision when you build curl, use A, B, or C to provide this feature, or maybe not have that feature at all. <clears throat> so yeah, you can select them and you can usually select to not have it at all. I mean, you can select TLS backend in curl, but you can also select to do it without TLS if you want to. A lot of the backends are platform dependent, which means that you can select from them on all platforms. So pretty much your particular build platform might put some restrictions. So you can't use S channel TLS on anything except Windows, uh, but you can use a lot of other on platform uh, on other backends on Windows as well. And you can use security transport, the secure transport TLS on Mac, and you can use OpenSSL on Mac, but you can not use secure transport on anything except uh, an Apple OS and so on. So, and they backends may differ in features. They can differ quite a lot actually. Uh, and we try to handle that internally as well, but that's when p people ask me sometimes why you would pick one particular backend compared to another. And that's usually, that's one of the reasons, right? If you figure out one of the backends have more features or more features that matches what you want, then you go with that. And they can, very much different in licenses, licensing. So whatever backend you, you pick and the backend uses a third party library and that third party library will have a license that will affect you and your ability to use that in your device or application. Some of the uh, third party libra libraries, libraries are also, you know, mature, immature, beta version, very good, very reliable or not. So that might also uh, affect your choice and uh, which one to go with. <clears throat> and the internal APIs for handling backends are never exposed externally. So the idea, the idea here is that whatever backend you pick, that's not immediately exposed in the, in the APIs that you're using in, in, for applications. That said, some of it will be exposed. For example, if you have limited functionality so for some options and stuff won't be available if you build with a particular backend but it's then provided in a more generic way you so that the api will expose that and show that and tell you that and we have a lot of different backends in curl so we have it for idn uh, international domain name names you know uh, non-latin names in in, <coughs> in domain names we have it for name resolving, how to resolve a name to IP address. We have a lot of TLS backends. We have three SSH backends. We have started to introduce HTTP backends this year. We have two separate HTTP3 backends and we have different HTTP, uh, backends for HTTP content encoding, basically com uh, automatic compression for HTTP. And I'm sure there will be more in the future. And um, yeah, I'm sure people will come up with more ways and I'm, I'm, I think this is an excellent way in providing cool stuff to curl and an ability to, you know, provide features and provide optional features without putting a burden or things to every user, but, but rather have users opt in to particular things. So it's, it's really cool. IDN backends, we have two different ones. <clears throat> and of course it works like this. The, the generic lib curl, we have an internal API to do IDN conversions. Uh, <coughs> and, we, you, and the generic lib curl, of course, you don't have to care about exactly which backend that provides that IDN conversion because it'll do that um, independently. Um, so um, yeah, and it works like this for, for a lot of backends. So for a resolver, you can pick one of the three resolvers. We have a fourth one being discussed which I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm personally a bit excited about. So um, hopefully we will have four resolver back backends going forward. Uh, IDM backends, resolver backends, you have to pick one of them at build time and you cannot change at runtime. 
uh, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to what you can change in runtime and, and build time, but um, there's a, a bit of a mix. Some of them you can change at runtime, some of them you have to pick at build time. And again, resolving backends, you don't internally you don't have to care about which particular thing you built your curl to use because the generic lib curl doesn't care and doesn't have to care. TLS backends, there are a lot of TLS backend support. There are 14 different libraries that we support. They are actually supported. Uh, <clears throat> some of them actually use, um, uh, what should I say, combined code. So there are actually not 14 different source files for that. Actually, I think it's 10, 11. Um, because OpenSSL and LibreSSL and BoringSSL and AmiSSL are pretty much done using the same source file. Anyway, so we have a different, a bunch of different uh, TLS backends, of course. And TLS backends, they can, you can enable several of them, and you can pick one at runtime. So, but in, when you can only pick it once during a life, uh, the lifetimes, so you cannot re-pick it. So you have to pick one when it starts, and then it'll get that, which is, uh, uh, it's an unfortunate drawback. But we really don't have any way to unload or un in it to back a TLS backend so you have to once you've gone with the TLS backend you have to st stick with that or you restart and pick another one and we, we of course solve that by having similarly in, in a similar way to, that I explained to the protocol handlers we have SSL handlers we call struct curl SSL which sets up the details for the particular TLS uh, backend <clears throat> so in a similar vein there how to use TLS in, internally in curl you don't have to care about which particular backend that's present or and provide the specific TLS and cryptographic uh, functionality. We use an internal API. We we don't we sort of shield off the specifics from the generics. So the generic part just speaks uh, TLS really uh, things, and the internal API will translate that to the particular uh, implementation for the particular. Uh, backend code. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, for the, I could call it the OpenSSL family, which is the OpenSSL and its forks. Uh, BoringSSL and LibreSSL, of course, being two forks. AmiSSL, I don't, I don't think, I don't know if they uh, call themselves a fork, but it's a, it's a flavor of OpenSSL, I would say, on Amiga, actually. And they all use the same OpenSSL source code actually internally, <clears throat> but it, it for for the better part of curl it doesn't matter. It's, we have the same approach. It, the SSH backends the same way. We have an internal API abstracts the particular implementation. We have three different SSH implementations <clears throat> or support for three different SSH libraries, and they are. They have different features, they have different licenses, they have different footprints, they have different uh, characteristics. So they're, they're also, like the TLS backends, they, these are rather different between each other. So if you build your own curl for your particular surrounding environment setup, uh, you, you may really yeah, sort of consider which one of these to go for. And of course, I mentioned I've added support for HTTP backends this year. So th we added support for Hyper, really. And adding support for Hyper as a backend really made me have to introduce the concept of HTTP backends. So we have to you pick at build time. Do you want to go with the native one, the built-in one, or the Hyper one? The same thing there. The high-level uh, HTTP API, and it switches between the implementations. Uh, in the HTTP case, it's a little bit more complicated, maybe it, it, uh, simply because Hyper is only Hyper is, I would say, a lower layer HPI, also lower layer library, so it doesn't really do all HTTP that we need in curl. So there's a maybe a top level HTTP done in curl and a lower layer HTTP that is provided by this uh, HTTP. API. And the same thing, HTTP3, uh, content encoding, same thing. Uh, here you can pick one or all of these, uh, or I mean, and you can use, so the internal API actually makes it automatic, so it'll use one of these three or, I mean, any combination. 
uh, in case of need and you can build in or out all of these three in, in uh, curl and <coughs> really i wanted to show you this because this then shows how it all sort of works combined and here i've tried to color code them so you can see the purple ones are one or more uh, you, in in runtime and the black ones are uh, well dark gray ones are just one at build time or you, know, you pick just one at build time so it'll be just one at runtime so basically when, when you're when you're going when you're using your application is the yellow cloud up there and it uses the public api and it uh, communicates with the core curl core curl being the big uh, thing in the middle here and core curl has a number of AP, internal apis i mean having internal api is also good because we can change them whenever we want without them affecting the public api and without them affecting the application but when the core curl then communicates through the the internal api and then over to the backend specific code which means that the the core curl doesn't know about the specifics for each particular backend so this is how it works and in this case we have uh, what six different backends concepts big internal apis and it's it's a fairly um straightforward concept really and uh, you have to all of these apis are specific for the particular use cases so they're, they're i don't think they have a lot of things in common but the, the common thing is the general approach here that we're abstracting the specifics from the in the backends from the generics in the core curl to enable this and this is a pretty good concept so we could easily uh, extend this going into more uh, more areas if we want to and and of course this is also a way you know back to things when we talk about doing memory safety in curl this is a way that is fairly easy that if if you imagine that these boxes on the outside are all written in memory safe languages like rust or whatever that would then combined be a build that uses more memory safe code for example or whatever more mature code or better code or better third-party dependencies and it also makes it possible for curl to remain working in a lot of different environments because a lot of these backends and, and different libraries they might or might not exist in on your particular platform or your particular operating system you know your devices your real-time operating systems or whatever so it'll adopt and work in a lot of different situations uh, and for your specific requirements and in, in a really good way pretty much and but then again of course you can imagine the number of combinations here because all of these can then be combined in in the millions and millions of build combinations and setups <coughs> so some of the important caches i mentioned already um so we have the connection pool i mentioned it keeps them based on names they they hold connections around uh, and uh, sorry uh, and it's important that it's keeping connections around based on names because it means that it, when it doesn't have to resolve a host name to find uh, an existing old connection to a host because it uses just the host name and that's the one you're using in the url and they kept alive or in the pool for 100 seconds <laughs> 118 seconds by default which might sound like an odd number why 118 but it actually is selected rather carefully because it's happened so of course the longer you hold it in the cache the less i mean important it is because connection reuse is really good just moments after it was used and the longer you keep it there the, the bigger is the risk that it won't work when you try to reuse it so basically there's a, a long tail so at some point it's really no point to keep it there anymore and we decided to use 118 because it's just under two minutes and two minutes happens to be a very important limit because a lot of uh, equipment is cutting off uh, idle connections after two minutes so it seems that up to two minutes it's sensible to reuse connections after two minutes it's not really a sensible thing to keep um, keep there so that's just how, how we've decided you can extend it or you can shorten it with options and there are several options that control how to have the connection and pool is used actually and it kills the oldest unused uh, if full when you want to add more 
connections to it and you can control the size of it so the size is fixed per well you can read up about it <coughs> and we have a dns cache of course of dns cache being of course the name to the ip address which means that if you're reusing the same hostname many times and you can't uh, reuse the connection you can at least reuse the the uh, address from from the dns cache and they'll kept in the dns cache for 60 seconds by default and <coughs> this is actually not limited by size so it can actually increase quite a lot if you resolve a lot of host names in a short time well within a minute and the the, the thing here is why is it kept for, for for just 60 seconds by default and that's of course because of uh, uh, how name resolving works on on, on I would say in POSIX, the generic APIs for doing this on most operating systems, we don't get a TTL for the host name. So we don't actually know how long the name is expected to live or ex expected to exist, in a, you know, the mapping name to IP. So we don't know. 60 seconds is just, you know, a made up number. Let's pretend it'll work for 60 seconds into the future. And that's a little bit shaky, but then again, going below below 60 seconds for anyone is also shaky. So it's, it works out pretty good, actually. But increasing the, this uh, number is also a bit of a dangerous ground. I mean, not dangerous in, as in security, maybe, but uh, it might make things not work as good as you want to. Someone pointed out uh, a while ago that this cache is not written to scale to gazillion. Someone did. I think they did somewhere around 10 to 15k requests with different host names per second, which made the uh, DNS cache grow to, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of host names um, within that minute and, and didn't really scale very well. So uh, room for improvement <coughs> in case you need something to, to work with. Uh, yeah, and we keep session IDs, SLS session IDs uh, cached. They are basically just a hash or, or a code to use to shortcut subsequent uh, TLS handshakes. We only keep a few <coughs> in memory. HTTP cookies, of course, they are also sort of a cache. We can we keep them in memory, we can store them on disk. Um, they're not enabled until you tell it to use it. And the <coughs> cookies are control they were really complicated really but there is uh, controlled by this cookie spec really so it's really defined how to work um, we don't limit the cookie jar in memory per size even if we maybe should do that so it could grow to qu quite a large amount but it's never become a problem problem so far all service mapping is similar to caching uh, sorry to, to cookies and you have to enable it to, to get it there <coughs> HSTS mapping, also similar to old services, basically, um, it pretty much says this host name and port number combination should always do HTTPS, even if you try HTTP in the future. <coughs> yeah, so a lot of different caches, uh, and I'm sure we will come up with more ways and more caches going forward because some of the things just have to be kept in memory, right? So that you do things in the future faster you a lot of things a lot of applications do things iteratively you know many transfers many connections and stuff like that so it's, it makes a lot of sense to keep to remember things for for performance and for efficiency portability <laughs> uh, i just wanted to get uh, i talked a lot about how we do things and i wanted to just get um shortly describe our approach or our main concepts around portability and we to put everything short and blunt we assume 32-bit operating systems 32-bit architectures and a POSIX API blap that's basically what we assume if you if you have that you're good to go and it's really maybe that well, the more the more of this you have the better it is if you have a POSIX api it's really easy to port curl to that operating systems it, it gets harder the further away from POSIX you get and of course everything in curl is written in c89 i mean c the language c at the c89 standard level which is 
the first NCC version it's really old conservative and people will think it's uh, really really old but still we've stuck to this for portability's sake we might at some point go to C99 instead but I haven't really <clears throat> nobody has really fought for it and there's are no really 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 strong reasons to do that but this means that an int in curl is always 32-bit. It's always 32-bit. It really, it's never anything else. It can't be anything else. There are no platforms where int is not 32-bit, where curl runs. <coughs> that makes things easy. A long in curl is either 32 or 64-bit, because it runs on also, of course, on 64-bit platforms, but also because long is either 32 and 64 even on some 64-bit platforms, it's going to be 32-bit. So this is the situation. <clears throat> when we build curve, we focus on the two different build systems, configure and CMake. We, if you want to go with a really the most mature, the most functional one, you go with the configure build. I'm biased because that's the one I work with. There's the CMake build, which is a little bit behind it works for most on, especially for the most common build setups and build combinations they generate a pretty much a long set of different have defines have this feature have blah 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 so a lot of if you route, write code that wants to depend on specific features that are not globally accessible you if they fit on that symbol you, i mean if you just read any source code in curl you will see if they have on something um, so if you do, if you go to a non POSIX platform, Windows, real time operating systems, you will need macros and you will need s support functions to remap from the POSIX style that we're using in curl to the native style you're using on that particular platform you're, you're focusing on. If you don't use ASCII platforms, and that's of course a very niche area of, of platform, EBC DIC systems, you need conversion functions and there the, we support those platforms too. So you, you can do it. I, my bet is that we won't see a lot of new ports to such platforms because they're sort of a dying breed really. An interesting little detail, of course, with portability and C is that we don't ever do non-aligned memory accesses, which this is something the kids, of course, these days don't think about, but you can't do more than 8-bit uh, mem uh, aligned memory access. If you're sort of, you're trying to read an int or a long from an unaligned, that's an odd, uh, I mean, odd, uneven memory address that won't work on some of the older uh, architectures like old arm and old spark and old uh, some of the other cpu platforms rarely used these days because modern arm and intel of course uh, support unaligned memory accesses but we we don't do them because we want to have maximized uh, portability and of course, we have CI and Manchest on many platforms to make sure and to help us stick to these uh, concepts. We don't test on as many platforms as we should. So portability is not always verified really good with the CIs, but that's also uh, the result of the CI systems. We're using the, I mean, freely available uh, uh, CI systems and they don't actually provide that many different platforms to run the CI s tests on. And also for practical reasons, some of the s uh, systems we support in a really older legacy systems, they're very, very slow. So running CI tests on them would be really horrible uh, experience too, because they're so slow. It takes a long time for them to run builds and tests. So it wouldn't be practical. So usually though as long as we work on these the main platforms we support we rarely introduce regressions for other platforms as long as those platforms are POSIX likes it's harder to keep functionality for the non-POSIX ones like the OS 400 or the real-time operating systems Windows <coughs> uh, we keep Windows pretty much on float for because we have a lot of CIs on Windows so that makes Windows sort of an exception uh, in windows is an exception in many ways anyway but uh, so so that's pretty much how, how we handle that at least 
<clears throat> and with that, I think I am done for today. I just wanted then to show you this little thing that we have gotten reports of, of curl running on these 86 different operating systems. And I'm only counting Linux as one. So uh, some will say that, well, there are many different Linux operating systems. And sure, maybe if I would count Linux distros, there would be hundreds and hundreds or more. But this, this is just Linux is one. I actually count uh, UC Linux as a, a separate one because it's slightly different. But otherwise, I try to... Um, what's a, what's an operating system what's the difference between them uh, it's it's a, it's a juggle so uh, let's not get into the details we don't have to discuss exactly how how the definition works but uh, just enjoy the fact that this is a lot of names more names than any mortal can even remember uh, by themselves I would say that most of these run on hardware very few of them are virtualized of course you can run a lot of them virtualized too but but um, these are mostly run on hardware and they've run curl. I've, <laughs> I've used very few of them. I've seen this myself on very few of them. Most of these I've gotten report and reported by users I've found online and I've, a bunch of them are, you know, have figments of support in the curl source code and a lot of these have never you know reported back any patches and stuff like that so a lot of these maybe needed particular patches that we never got back and so on uh, still i i i, I uh, enjoy the multitude here anyway i uh think um yeah and it's, it's sort of in the same vein these are the 22 different cpu architectures that i've logged that people have told me that they run curl on and again what's a cpu architecture uh, i know then p people tend like to complain that i actually mentioned x86 64 as separate from x86 but i don't mention uh, the 64-bit versions of arm and power and some others here so maybe i should count them as 21 architectures maybe they're 26 I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it's that important. Then exact number isn't that important. I think, you know, you should take the bigger picture here, a lot of different ones. And it doesn't really matter which ones, as long as we have, as long as a 32 bit and we have GCC or a sensible compiler that supports, uh, support uh, the particular platform, we're good. Oh, that was a weird transition. Okay, uh, whew, I'm done. Uh, <clears throat> I realized this was a bit of a tough uh, presentation that uh, maybe proved some, uh, gave us all some challenges. At least it gave me some challenges in trying to actually explain all that. But uh, anyway, that's it. This is uh, libcurl and how it works in April 2021. Have fun. <laughs>